Hi, everyone. So I was kind of, when Jamie asked me to do the talk, I was kind of in between the two different topics. One was why Ember sucks for beginners. And the second one was the peep stack. So talking about Phoenix and Elixir together. And I kind of went between the two for a while and I decided on this one. So I hope it's all OK. So I was trying to think of a name for the peep stack. And I thought if, you, if I started with the P stack that you'd probably all laugh or heap with Heroku in there or Pepe stack, maybe. <laughs> but some guy called Justin on the internet already named it for me. So I didn't really need to bother. I just kind of followed his article on Medium and he'd already written it for me. So if you don't know already, um, the peep stack is Phoenix, Elixir, Ember and Postgres. Is anyone using Phoenix or Elixir? Oh, just a, f oh, a few, OK. Um, I've been using it for about four or five weeks. I'm not an expert on this, but I thought I'd present uh, what I've kind of been learning. So I'm going to talk about how I started my startup. And to begin with, it didn't use three of the four of these. It was actually something that is very common. So if I'd, started, if I'd kept using this stack, I would probably not be here tonight. I'd probably be at Backbone London, not Ember London. So I started off on a Rails, Ruby, Backbone, and Postgres uh, stack. And the reason for that is I kind of knew that, and I was very comfortable with that. So I run a site called Supine. It's not quite launched yet. Basically, what I'm trying to do is something that you guys would probably already know, but I'm trying to make coding a lot easier for beginners. So you guys probably already know quite a lot about this. But basically, I'm trying to build a site that looks like this. I'm not allowed to actually show this online because I don't own that photo. So the idea is, for beginners, they can't get online very easily. They don't really know what they're doing. There's going to be lessons as part of this, but I'm showing you how I got a site very easily online. There's a preview there. And then you can publish, and you have an instant site online in about 20 seconds. So I started off in January on this stack, Rails, Ruby, Backbone, Postgres. But I very quickly found out that Backbone sucks for particularly complex data models. So I went to see a certain guy that you might recognize. Now, I heard that this guy, Jamie White, seems to love Ember. So I went to see him. At uh, the pair sessions that with associates do. Now, if you don't know about with associates pair sessions, look into it. It's really, really good. If you want to chat about anything, they're really, really good and really nice people to talk to. So very quickly, I changed. I put in Ember instead of Backbone. And initially, I started on Ember Rails, and that kind of started to get a really big project structure. I had everything in one big, big folder. And that got more and more difficult as I brought people into freelance. So very quickly, I changed to Ember CLI. But insert a passage of time. So starting about six weeks ago, maybe, I met this guy, Steve Graham. Um, and there's a little cat. I've got another little cat break. And he's running a site called Teller. Now, the idea behind Teller is basically APIs for banks. And he showed me what he was doing. This isn't live yet. And he kind of went in the office with me, sat down, and showed me what he was doing. And I was like, holy moly, how did you do this? I thought he was doing it locally and on test data, but he was actually using the real uh, version of the site that actually got real data from bank APIs. So I was instantly jealous of what he was doing. And, you know, I was then looking at my Rails app being oh, this is really slow. This sucks. So it's starting to get really, really big. You know, it's a Rails app. It has Pusher. It has a ton of gems in there. Basically, becoming this big monolith of a site. So I kind of did a risk. I was kind of looking at this app, thinking, do I have time to change this stuff? I've got some like investor meetings, and I've got a school to do pretty soon. It's about six weeks away. Do I have time to do this? Should I spend weekends actually learning this thing? But then I kind of thought of it in this way. Am I allowed to swear? OK. Do I have, do I have time to make my startup really fucking good? And I thought, yes, of course I do. And it's good for the user. We talked about performance on the front end, and this is going into the back end. Now, I put my site on Heroku, and I was clicking around, and it was pretty slow to actually update. And as soon as I started changing it over to Elixir and Ember, I suddenly got these speed increases five to 10 times the speed that I previously got. And because I was already used to Ruby on Rails, it wasn't that hard to actually change over. So I switched 
very quickly. Now, if you don't know about Phoenix, uh, phoenixframework.org, really, really good site. Uh, kind of goes into a lot more detail. And again, it does say productive, reliable, fast, which is very, very true. And if you're a podcast, uh, podcast fan, as I am, as you can probably tell by my T-shirt, um, there's a good, uh, a good thing on the change log. It's a really, really good uh, kind of hour, hour and a half kind of uh, interview with Brian from Dockyard about how they betted their company on Elixir and Ember. So you probably know all the Ember stuff, but a lot of things to do with Elixir in there as well. If you look at the Dockyard site as well, it's really, really quick. I showed it to someone the other day, and they were like, is that real? How did they do that? And that's the kind of magic that, you know, 10 years ago, people were the same with Rails. So it's the same kind of thing today. Now, if you don't know what they are, um, Elixir is basically a kind of similar language to Ruby and Python in the same way that Phoenix is built on top uh, of Elixir, Rails is built on top of Ruby, Django is built on top of Python. But it's a different kind of beast altogether. So why did I want to use Elixir? So these are some of the main reasons that I went with Elixir. Uh, the concurrency model is really, really good. Uh, I'll kind of talk about some of the examples in a bit. Uh, it's really scalable. Again, it's really, really fast. It's built on top of Erlang, which has a huge history. And also, you can use a lot of the libraries from Erlang in Elixir. And it also has Mix, which is a very good um, kind of rake slash bundler kind of tool that makes it really, really easy. And why Phoenix? For me, it was very Rails influenced. The guys who uh, made uh, Phoenix came from a Rails background. But it also had this stuff where like, the web sockets were built in. There's a great team behind it, and it's really, really quick. There are some downsides, though. So because this is quite a new thing, and it's kind of started getting a bit trendy in the last maybe six months, there's still a very small community, which does mean there's less tools for people to use. I would also say that it's a little bit uglier code than Ruby. It's just personal preference. I like Ruby's very, very simple code. And occasionally, Phoenix uh, documentation is a little bit sucky. But that can always be worked on it. You know, three months' time, it might be really, really good. So this is a kind of um, example. I'm using Atom. And I know that I might get kicked out because I'm using Atom. But you can kind of see the kind of very similar structure to Rails. So instead of the app folder, we have a web folder. And in there, we have things like controllers, models, views, and templates as well. We've got a router in there. We've got a kind of um, a mix file, which is a little bit like bundler and gem files in there as well. So it's very, very similar to how Rails is set up, because it comes from that background. So I'm going to talk a bit about my favorite bits of Elixir and Phoenix together. So one bit that I kind of got a bit confused with at first, and I was like, what is going on? Is Pipes. So Elixir has these things called pipes. Now, this is actually taken from some code that I've written on the site that I'm building right now. So in Phoenix, I've got a change set, which is the change to the database. I want to generate a password for my user. I want to generate an API key. And I want to put it in the database. Now, this kind of pipe with the little kind of uh, angle bracket might look a bit confusing at first. But the way it kind of works is you take the first element and you put it as a first argument as on the next line. And then you do that again, and you do that again. So this kind of code at the bottom is exactly the same as the one at the top, just a little bit cleaner. And the more you do it, the more your code gets really, really clean, really, really quick, because you can see the processes that you're going through over and over again. Now, pattern matching the guards is one of my favorite things, actually. So this is another example from my code. I'm using this case of a user login using username and password. Now, if I was to do this in something like Rails, I'd probably have a lot of if statements, a lot of else clauses in here as well. But with this, it's actually pattern matching. So this bit up here returns back these kind of um, bits back. So if this is fine, it returns back a user with OK. But occasionally, it does lots of different things. So in this case, I know there's an error, and it says no user. So it's definitely going to do a certain thing. If it's a bad password, it does a different thing. If it doesn't hit any of these errors at the start, no user and bad password, it does something else. But that's a variable that I can pass through and deal with in a different way. And if it's none of that, then I can set another variable to handle in a different way altogether. So it's, quite, it's really useful for testing as well, because you can put a lot of different <laughs> things in it, see if it works, see if it doesn't uh, fail in different ways. It also has. Uh, you can use the same function, and again, but use these things called guards. Now, this bit over here is the guard. 
So this is part of the same bit of code. It's just we handle it in two different ways, depending <coughs> on what's coming in, the kind of functional programming aspects of it. So in this case, our params are just zero. There's nothing in the map. So basically, there's no object in there. It's just an empty uh, map. We handle it in a different way than it would do if it does have parameters below. So this stops this kind of big if and else clauses. You're handling things in a different way, which makes it a lot easier to test. Now this is another example of the, exactly the same thing. We're using different arguments in different ways. So for instance, this bit of code is actually doing two things. It's finding the project and the file name to serve back to the user. So at the top, if there isn't a project, the project's nil, just return nil. Now I want to handle my very particular file type in a certain way. So if for any project, using this underscore, we're using superhigh.js and we're handling it in a different way than the other things below it. Now, if I'm on the root of a, uh, a root of a page, then my file name is going to be blank. So I'm going to set that to be uh, recursive. So this recursively goes into the bottom function. So we're saying, in this bottom case, handle any file name in any different project. So that's all one chunk of code. Yep, we're yep. Not defined, we're allowed yep. to redefine the module. Exactly, yeah. 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 So it pan matches it in that way. So yeah, it kind of goes through the code. This will all be on one page itself. We also have channels which are built directly into Phoenix. So this is an example that I made of a Slack group. So we're going to join a particular channel on Slack, and it's going to return back to our front end saying OK. And then whenever we want to push a message back and forth, we can say, this is, our, um, this is our kind of message that we're sending back. Here's our body that's going in. And this is a socket that it deals with. And we can then pass it. We can broadcast it back to our front end. And if you, you can do this at any point in any controller or even models as well. You just set on your endpoint a broadcast saying the topic, the event, and the message that you want to send back to your users. It's also particularly easy to deploy to Heroku. Now, it's not a default. You have to set it as a build pack. But it's very easy. There's very good instructions on there. And it's actually, you know, you just add a build pack, you deploy, and it's on Heroku. So when I was saying earlier that I needed it for a deadline, the reason why I was doing this school um, called Super High School, basically I was giving out free coding lessons to 15 people. And this started last night. So there's me teaching 15 people on SuperHive, I needed it to be ready. And one thing that one of, the, one of the students said was, he was kind of dumbfounded, like, how did you do that thing? Now, he's not a developer, he's an illustrator. So he was getting confused, like, how did you do that thing where it was really, really quick? And it goes back to that performance thing that we were talking about earlier. Like, it feels like magic. And in a way, it kind of went back to when I saw Stevie's teller. I was kind of going like, holy moly, now, my students have the same envy as I did when I saw Steve's site. So I, I really think that Phoenix is going to be the next big thing. Um, if you want to build APIs, if you want to build any kind of site, Phoenix is really, really fast. And built on top of Elixir, it's really, really good. So thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> yes. So the API wasn't particularly huge. Most of it's on the front end because it's all kind of uh, user interface and kind of making it simpler. Um, so in terms of the models, there was about six or seven different models, different controllers um, handling that way. Um, it took around two weeks to switch everything over, including some tests. Um, so it was, quick, it was pretty quick. I mean, I was doing it over the weekends as well because I was a bit panicked and kind of like, shit, I need to actually get things done. Uh, test frameworks. Yeah. So the one built into um, Phoenix is called Xtest. It's very similar to how Minitest works in um, Rails. It's, you know, it's very easy to pick up. And it's the same kind of thing of um, the guys obviously coming from a Ruby background. They want to use pretty much the same tools to make it a lot easier. It's also a lot quicker to do tests as well because of the concurrency model. Anyone else? Um, so the reason that I switched over is because the way that I'm actually um, 
making things that are very kind of interactive and a lot of kind of messages going back and forth because um, I'm basically building the code editor but with a lot of the things built for beginners. So there's things like autosave. So for every two seconds, it's going to save a file. So I want it to be really, really quick and do a lot of background processes. Um, so if I was to do a normal kind of content site, I probably wouldn't use it. I'd probably use something very simple and just get it online very quick. But for something where it's like hard APIs and lots of kind of requests going over and over again. And you know, I, you know, I only dealt with like two uh, dinos on Heroku last night and it held up perfectly fine. Um, we did image upload and we had like, you know, 15 people at exactly the same time uploading like 10 megabytes of content and it handled it perfectly well, like no slowdown. Um, people just was like, oh, it's finished already. And I was like, that's right. Uh, but it's that kind of speed that um, people were actually really surprised about. They, they thought it was doing something that it actually wasn't. It was just the speed of it and the kind of the way that it's written, really. So would you say it's, it's meant to be used as any other scripting language? Yeah. Kind of yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it, Elixir is way easier to write than something like Erlang. I've kind of looked at Erlang libraries because of having to implement a few things. But I look at Erlang and I'm a bit like, oh my god, I don't know what this, any of this means. So Elixir is a lot better for me, uh, just because I, I'm from a Ruby background. I heard an interview with Jose Marie. Yeah. He talked about it in terms of almost like a, almost like a Lisp, where the, it's built on this kind of power, powerful macro system, and this idea yeah. of treating code as data. And it allows mm. things like um, Phoenix's router DSL to be built, but still compiled to something on the metal on the VM. So yeah. I, think it, I think it's in, I think it's, I don't know if scripting language is necessarily what he was going for. I think friendly language is definitely what he was going for. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's very, it's a lot easier to see like the, the flow from the start and the end from where your data is coming from. There's none of the kind of Rails magic that goes on and things disappear and come back. Um, so it, I, I've always find it a little bit kind of like easy to see what's happening throughout the whole process from like request to response. Yeah. Do you need to think about any of the threading or process model or did it with like, say your, yeah. your Heroku, yeah. I don't use Heroku, so okay. say, yeah. say it was a box with eight cores. Yeah. Would it just use all of them? Uh, I, I don't know enough about it okay. to uh, know. I mean, what I've done at the moment is there's a background task that whenever you upload an image, it just handles it in the background. So it's a very easy thing you to you just have add. To specify threads or processes? Uh, yeah, that it basically spawns a task, okay. um, so which is kind of very similar. Yeah, yeah, and it's because it's built in, there's no kind of like uh, rescue kind of things or psychics. Or, yeah, so it's a lot easier to just be like, OK, this needs to do this, cool. off it goes. Can you tweak so, this? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. I was actually just on that. I was reading a bit about the, the Erlang virtual machine last night, and uh, from what I gather, and I'm definitely going to get this completely wrong, <laughs> I think in, in Erlang, Erlang processes, they call them, don't yep. map onto operating system yeah. threads at all. What it does is when Beam boots, it will spawn up a thread for each core yeah. and have, you know, have them running constantly and then distributing processes between these operating system threads, but you never see them. Yeah. You're always dealing with these very lightweight. I suspect yeah. the Erlang processes might be able to even live on a different box. And that's, you know. Yeah. That's I think you can do distribute, distributed code. Of, I know. Yeah. I am kind of, you know. You, you yeah. have a mesh server. Yeah. And basically, when you spawn a task, it has a BAD. Yep. And the BAD you receive it. Yeah, you can basically spin it off and then receive it when it's done in the end and kind of handle it that way. Any other questions? Is there an um, Elixir meetup? I don't know, actually. I'm so new to it that I'm kind of like, I discovered this brand new thing. Yeah, I saw it a couple of months ago. <laughs> yeah, it's really good, though. Um, like, I've kind of been playing, well, not even playing with it. I've been kind of using it in production for the last six weeks and it's just held up really really well and really quick development as well that's what I was kind of surprised about I thought I'm gonna learn this new language and get stuck really really quick but it wasn't quite like that at all yeah yeah so um, Phoenix um, has got web built in there's like a 
JavaScript library that you can include, but I've kind of ignored that and just used the Ember side of it instead and just kind of connected directly to the WebSocket. Um, there is like an Ember WebSocket um, kind of add-on that you can use. You just connect and it just does the same thing that you would do with the Phoenix kind of library in the same way. So yeah, it's, it's really easy to actually integrate with Ember, so that's a great part of it. <coughs> Anyone else? Yes. Is it good? It's pretty good. Uh, Steve taught today, didn't he? The yeah, yeah. So Showing sure off stuff. Oh, cool. I'll go to the next one then. <laughs> Anyone else got a question? How's the Postgres adapter? Um, it's okay. Um, it's using Ecto, which is a kind of uh, so it's kind of a spin out. It's not as integrated as uh, something like Ruby would be, where you would do like product all, for instance. You kind of have to do like repo dot all, get the products, and then that kind of thing. So it's a little bit of a kind of twist on that. So it's a bit more of like old school ORM rather than a Railsy kind of one. Um, but it works quite fine. Uh, there's not much documentation on it though. That's the problem. So I've kind of had to like really delve deep into the docs to kind of like work things out. And I think that's a problem because it's all brand new, and there's a lot of people working to make things a lot better, and things change very quickly. So. In the time that I've been doing Phoenix, it's been uh, 0.13, and it's already on 0 0.19, uh, 16 already. Yeah. And it's just like very quick in six weeks. So I think they kind of need to slow it down or do bigger releases, maybe. Don't know. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, do you use any No, I, I've not really. I don't don't know too much about it to be honest. Still quite new to it. Yeah. I think it hit 1.0 quite recently, so I think so it's. it's oh really? Yeah. Oh, um, so yeah, <laughs> it's fairly stable. Um, Phoenix is changing a bit more than uh, Elixir is, uh, but yeah, I, it's not changed since I've started working on it. But yeah. So I'm doing the startup on my own at the moment, yeah. so it's kind of like I can do what I want. But I imagine the problem is well, if I'm, I'm trying to hire people pretty soon, not yet. So it's a kind of hard sell. It's like come and learn this brand new thing, and you know, yeah. what do I say on the job advert? Like developer so who's I'm doing new stuff. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, it's it's kind of um, it's kind of something that I was a bit like, do I change this because it'll be a lot difficult, a lot more difficult to hire. But on the opposite hand, I kind of think that the people who are good developers will be more attracted to do something new and try some uh, new things. So it's kind of it's a tricky one, really. Do you ever find that there's a library that it requires massive amounts of Erlang knowledge? And you just um, there's only one that I'm really dealing with, which is um, one which kind of transfers things to uh, Amazon Web Services. <laughs> and apart from that, it's actually really easy to integrate, to be honest. Like, you, j it's a little bit of a different syntax, and you kind of have to translate things a little bit, but it's generally okay. So I, I've done it fairly straightforward, and it works. So yeah, cool. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.